So we are at Women Matters in November 22. Reinforcement of the spiritual came up as a topic. And I'm curious, you look very spiritual with your flowers around you. Victoria, would you like to, to, do, to start with a check-in? Oh, a check-in. Um, mm -hmm. Well, my whole life is falling apart. So um, she says cavalierly. <laughs> so I am. Uh, so I am trying to under. I'm trying to reinforce the spiritual in my own life right now with renewed vigor to remember that everything passes away and everything is permanent, uh, impermanent. Sorry, that was a mistake. And that um, that nothing matters except for the 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 that life. This life is a learning process. And it's all about learning and um, developing character. And everything else is just distraction, basically. So it's a very difficult path. And, um, and I have flowers because I'm making this up as I go along. I have flowers because <laughs> they symbolize the impermanent, because they only look beautiful for a short time, and then they die. And then they either have to be replaced or one has to simply um, remember the beauty. And so all we can do is live in the moment. So this is the moment. And I'm glad that I'm here in this moment with you ladies. And that's all that matters. And we could all die within the next minute. Well, that's kind of morbid. Um, <laughs> we need to embrace each, we need to embrace each moment that's my my motto so that's my check-in too that because i'm doing it on the literally on a minute by minute basis enjoy the cup of coffee while you have it in front of you don't anticipate the next one or dream about the one that passed away so i'll pass on to um monia who's chuckling maliciously at me no <laughs> no 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 because i was differently Oh. oh, you turned off your sound, Monia. You, you are yeah. muted. You are muted. You muted okay. by mistake. Uh, uh, our family talk. Uh, I had to write it down again because I don't. She was operated today for her sebaceous uh, cyst, sebaceous type. Sebaceous. I never heard the word before. Oh, I have I have them in my in my hands. Okay, so okay. <laughs> the dog has him above her tail. So um and it was she was so much sedated that she just she couldn't walk uh when they came home. So my uh, grandchild had to carry her up all the steps and she's now uh 15 kilos, so it's 30 pounds, so she had to carry her upstairs. And then she just, and, and there are so many photographs of her, like, and the whole family is so upset about it. Anyway, um, it's the first time I ever heard that our spiritual attention span is just three hours. And I really have to check now how I manage. Uh, because as far as I know, Whenever I go to my recliner to take a rest, I sort of meditate. And this is uh, more, less than three hours. So because my energy isn't that good at right now or up. So three hours, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll keep an eye on that. That's interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I pass on to you, Beatrice. Um, I'm in Portland, Oregon. I think every, every meeting, the last few meetings, I've been in a different part of the country. Um, I'm supposed to be here now for the, for a bit of a duration, um, except that next week I'm briefly going to San Diego, um, to help my mother with, um, dealing with items, um, at my grandmother's estate. Next, um, she week? died three years ago. What? Next week? This week. Sorry, I'm still on the weekend. Oh, 
tomorrow yeah matter. today's monday no i'm flying tomorrow yeah i'm flying tomorrow <laughs> tomorrow i'm going to san diego um it's, it's early in the morning um yeah i also have flowers um i got them at the farmer's market yesterday and i really love them i think they're very cheery it's it's very wet and gray here most of the time um and the temperature is cold so it's nice to have a little perk of sunshine via the flowers i impermanence is interesting i i always want to capture the impermanent that's my great impulse all the time taking pictures of shadows collecting heirlooms and objects from family members you know drying I have, a, I have a bouquet of flowers that I got for Valentine's Day last year that I let dry and is now in storage in New York because I don't want to throw them away um <laughs> so it might be a bit of a problem <laughs> um but I like to hold on and and remember the stories and remember the objects and try to capture the things that are supposed to fade away. Um, so I don't know. I'm not I'm I'm not ready to have a life of no past and no future. Um, but maybe we can talk about that. I'll pass to Heidi. Yeah, thank you. Victoria, before brought up this uh, notion that in, integral, not integral, spiritual uh, attention span is three hours. And I wonder what you mean with in, the, the intention span, because when I have met it go into meditation, I often have an intention span of one minute or two and not, <laughs> not three hours. I mean, <laughs> no, it's, it's the other way around. Um, it's the within, I, I just heard this from a, from a, one of my friend, friends at the Benedictine Monastery. So actually I haven't checked up whether it's really in the tradition or not, but I do know that in the, it's it's the opposite to that. It's not the attention span when you're in the spiritual state. It's, it's how long it, the maximum amount of time that you can stay focused on worldly things before something goes wrong. You have an argument, you get a temptation, you, um, what whatever so that that was this one monk's explanation to me of because I said why when you have the daily offices in the monastery why do you pray every three hours what's the reason for that tradition and that was his answer whether that's what Saint Benedict said or not I have to research in fact I've always, I've always planned to sort of follow up on that because um, I mean what what is true is that every monastic tradition seems to have this three hour. Um, pattern you know that 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 so so when um you know like when I went to Thich Nhat Hanh's monastery which is Zen Buddhist sort of Zen he has his, had his own style but um the bell the bell rang every three hours the the big the big gong so wherever you were on the property um of this big Buddhist monastery that out in the wilderness um you would hear the gong and everyone everyone would stop what they were doing, whatever it was, and just pause to sort of be mindful of where they are and what is going on. And so, so it's a sense of just being, I guess, being reminded. Um, so I, I don't wanna say that it's necessarily a, but I mean, so so anyway, that's the, but the other thing I wanted to say that um, is sort of the, the, the extreme opposite is that, my psychiatrist told me that um, that they've been that that scientists have been testing the attention span of children over the years, and now um, the the current attention span of children um, in our society is that of a of a goldfish. And that's, um, I guess they do it with you know I don't know how they test it, but it's it, th th that's actually like laboratory like you know, whatever, however they do it with, you know, MRIs or, or brain wave patterns or whatever. He didn't, he didn't go into detail. How but, much can a goldfish focus? Basically not at all. That's why they're moving around all the time. <laughs> I was wondering because I never heard. 
for the attention, but unless you just show him that you're going to feed him, then he has an attention span, food, food. Long enough to get the food, but then he goes away again, yeah. not even noticing if there's more food. But the point is that um, it's, it's, I mean, what my psychiatrist was pointing out was that it's becoming increasingly urgent in our society to learn how to slow down, to learn how to pay attention, to learn how to maintain attention to, um, and that's why meditation has become all the rage that mm -hmm. people are realizing that without an occasional um, opportunity to really slow down and, and just be in the moment, um, that er everything's going too quickly. We can't process our lives basically. So um, that's why even secular people are embracing like um, the like the um, what the the original in America was the MBSR um, mindfulness based stress reduction by John Cabot Zinn um, started that at Harvard Medical School and um, that's completely secular it has nothing to do with anything of course he you know obviously got the idea from Buddhism but but it's not, um, it's presented as a purely medical intervention and, um, you know, just to help people cure from various afflictions. So it's a, um, it's something that's acknowledged, you know, right across the board. So that, so the spiritual side is a whole other discourse, uh, which of course is what I'm interested in. But um, so anyway, I'll, that I've said my piece for the moment. Okay, thank you. I'm wondering. Um, I you... haven't done those check in yet. Uh, oh, you, yeah, oh. I was gonna say. oh, how did that? You, you interrupted her check-in. <laughs> oh, I did. No, oh, I did I ask you a question. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, my you stopped, my check, and you heard it. The the dogs went. Uh, they they were starting to bark like crazy. It's completely dark outside, and I hear them. I had to get them out, and I hear them barking somewhere. Might be a boar or something uh, around. So. The hunger was not so big as not to have to some bark. But when you talked, um, Victoria, I was thinking about the gong. We had the churches who were ringing the bell all every hour. Maybe it was the same. It was also the clock because people didn't have a clock. And so the church bells said what time it is of the day. And then, uh, yeah, but it might also be a reminder at least in Europe, no, there is a tradition that in all the places there's the church and ringing the bell. Also, people now see it as a nuisance and they don't want the church ringing anymore. I like it. I mean, I it. yeah. But when you live right under the under the bell tower, it might be disturbing sometimes, especially at night. You know, when you wake up. But or well, live uh, somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't know. I I in Brooklyn, I, the, my the church in my neighborhood didn't even do it every hour. It was occasional, but it's very beautiful bell ringing. And the people who lived across the street, living across the street from a church, would complain. And I thought, well, why did you move there? This church has been here for like ages. Yeah, you know, if you if it bothers you, live somewhere else. But it's the same in Austria. First, people move next to the church, and then they complain. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's so typically green. But I was wondering, uh, Victoria, you are, Heidi, is your check in finished? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's always uh, you are aware that carnations take a very, very long time to wilt. I know. Yeah, that's, that's, that's... <laughs> <laughs> these These are, you saw these two weeks ago um, at Women Matters. I wasn't this, there, so yeah. You weren't? No, I wasn't. Oh, well, Hanalee saw them. <laughs> the these this this bouquet is two weeks old. Uh -huh. um, what it takes though is is tender, loving care because I have to um, feed them and change the water, and I have to keep snapping off the the um, stem so so the so it still can absorb the water. But these are two yeah these are two weeks old. They, they, these were as tall as these when I got them. These are from yesterday. So mm. this is the new, the new. You have them next in two weeks. You still have them. That's, yeah. Yeah, and they, they, um, well, now they smell a little old, but they still, 
you still know their carnations, sort of. Um, <laughs> the wait, there was something I wanted to say. Oh, oh yeah, about the bells in the churches. Yeah, that's actually Heidi. That's um, now that I'm you know familiar with all these Catholic traditions. The Angelus, which I never knew about, the prayer, that's that's every, so the traditionally the bells um, ring at, that's six hour intervals, that's uh, 6 a.m. and noon and 6 p.m. And then I, they probably don't ring at midnight in most places, but maybe some villages they do. But that's, um, that's when you say the Angelus prayer, which is the, um, the, you know, basically the, do you, do you know what I'm talking about? The. Oh, it's the um, it's it's like the Ave Maria, but it's but it's it's longer and um, more and you, comprehensive. And it's you not, can probably Google it, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I can say it right now if you want, but I'm not sure. <laughs> go what? Ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, all right. Should I... <laughs> seems kind of secular okay unless um, it is two hours long then not but if it oh reasonable. no 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 it's short it's um the well you're supposed to say it with response sorry do you want to do the responses poop what other uh, responses do you know the do you know the angelus mm -mm. no but i'm founded on google and i'm putting oh. it in the chat oh okay oh we can all do it <laughs> we, we can convert this into a <laughs> okay. so that yeah, because it's it's with the call and response, but but the but the bells ring regardless of. So when people are in the fields working, um, they stop and pray just privately. It's so that's also a reminder. Um, but that's yeah. I wonder if the three hour thing. But anyway, yeah. So you can see it there. Thanks. So um, what are we supposed to respond? Well, so the so the the verse in response. So the the. the Whoever's the leader, R. yeah. The so the leader says the V and the response. Okay. Um, but but we don't, we don't have to do it right now. But um, but what it's very it's very um, the like when I go up to the Benedictine Abbey here, that's how I learned it. They they have little cards that where they printed it out and they put it on all the tables in the dining hall. So just before lunch is served, everybody says it. And it's it's actually it's it's very comprehensive the um, because the whole idea of it sort of it sort of you know spans the eternity because um, the last part you know pour forth we beseech thee O Lord thy grace into our hearts so it's it's the it's praying that we will you know we will be brought to the glory of Christ's resurrection so. So it's pretty comprehensive, and even though it's a relatively short prayer, so it to me, I don't know. I I, I just learned, as I said, in the lunchroom of the Abbey, <laughs> but but um, a lot of churches will do it if they have a mass, at, like a morning mass at, at that's at six a.m. or whatever. It's traditionally or or a noon mass. Sometimes we go down to the Italian church. But what I love about it is it's really true about about the attention span thing. That it's a it's like a um, it's it's like a gong. And Thich Nhat Hanh, um, you know, because he wanted to appeal to the secular people that didn't believe in anything spiritual. Um, I remember the retreat I went to at his monastery, he said things like, um, he, he said, create as many gongs in your in your daily life as you can. So his idea, not, not necessarily real ones, but, you know, a lot of people have those singing bells or whatever that are used for meditation. But he said, you know, when you're in traffic, and you you sit at a red light and a uh, red light instead of shimping about you know how it's going to make you late to your appointment, um, c pretend that the red light is a gong for, and and it's it's to 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 be mindful when you see the red light and sit in the in the traffic with the red light, take that as a moment a precious moment of meditation, and recollection. So it's this whole idea of of um, you know so then the secular version would just be to be mindful in every moment. And that's what I'm noticing I'm doing all the time. And oh, one of my teachers that I, I, I really like what she said, she says that she'll just very simply, instead of, you know, whole incantations and things, she just will stop and say, um, where am I? And then she answers herself here. When, when is it? Now, 
and that's it. That's all she does. But it's great. I do that sometimes when if I'm walking at the beach and it's so beautiful that, you know, just gorgeous, the sky and the clouds and the the water and the birds. And and I'm it's just, you know, the greatest gift you could imagine. And then I'm worrying about my mother's estate or or some bill that has to be paid or doing the laundry, you know, and then I think, what a waste. Like, why did I come all the way down here to this beautiful nature? So then I'll I'll stop myself with that that just that simple where am I, <laughs> and then I realize oh I'm here, <laughs> here at the ocean you know, and wh when is it? It's now. I have a question for the group because this this all started with this topic started because my mother was sharing that she's you know in a thousand classes and retreats to keep her um, what's the word we we used I already forgot it. Attention span. No. Oh, no. It was something else. No, that's right. What was it? Uh, reinforcement. Reinforced. Yeah. To keep the spiritual reinforcement. No, but I'm curious, you, Heidi and Monia, um, do you have things, ways in your day or in your week that you realign or, or you know, I mean, Heidi, you mentioned you sometimes sit down to meditate. Well, so did you, Manya. But are there other things you do that help you center? Well, one of the, I mentioned it somewhere else. One of the things I do is I light the candle every day when it gets dark. And I have my mantra, the peace for the world. We started it when they started the war in the Ukraine. And now it's, it has become, a, my husband claims, it's the candle lit every evening. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, that's something that reminds me. And when I get up in the night and I see the candle, it reminds me. And as I mentioned before, whenever I go into my recliner, I sort of meditate. I don't, and I text, of course, as well. But... Uh, Usually I just uh, breathe and I like, I like these two questions, where am I and uh, when is it, it is now. It, of course, Tolle, I'm reminded of Tolle, it's always now. And uh, my husband uh, told me when he came back from shopping that he didn't have the beautiful roses he wanted to give to me for my birthday. And I said, don't give me any roses. They will, and I have so much work to do with them. I have to clip them and water them. And I, we still have flowers on the balcony and they bloom beautifully. So I don't, uh, I have a friend uh, who is now 86 and she refuses cut flowers because they wilt. And they remind her that she's already wilting as well. And so she refuses. She, she takes flowers and, and she has flowers in her garden, but she never buys flowers in a vase. I, I do uh, sometimes, but right now I have flowers made of silk and they don't wilt at all. You have to dust them. <laughs> um, yeah, what remind, what else reminds me? Whenever I go in the elevator, I sort of be, I'm in the now. And yeah, that's about it. What I just right now remember. But it's also good uh, whenever you take a drink of water to remember the now and the importance of water. Uh, yeah. That's all I can contribute right now. <laughs> what about you, Heidi? I was thinking I have some rituals but I don't know if they are there to remind me of what you are saying, no? of being in the present. Like for instance, the cup of tea in the morning, cup of tea in the afternoon. That's more for 
sitting down and relax a little bit and structure the day, I would say. Um, for the attention, very often during the day, uh, it comes to me that I'm I'm reminded to pay attention on my body, on, on feeling the body, the whole body. And that's also a method when I'm awake at night, then I start to, to feel the, the feet and then the rest are all up the body and really have the sensation of, you know, living in the body, feeling the body everywhere. What I also do for getting realigned is listening to good music. So I have an uh, um, abonamento, how do you call that? A uh, subscription to the Berliner Philharmonic. And I'm listening to uh, Medici TV, who have very beautiful music. I think I told you, Monia, no? They have opera and everything, and very, very good stuff. In the, in the archive, many things of Claudio Abado, when he was the director, for instance, also the Philharmonic Orchestra. And then, you know, that's for me a moment when I sit down or lay down and then sometimes I only listen with the ears, but sometimes I listen with the whole body and try to 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 feel the vibration of this music, let it go through me. And this is certainly, in the past, uh, when I was completely out of, how do you say, out of balance, um, I regularly listen to Bach music mm -hmm. because that is always bringing me back. Always. Maybe not the first day, but the second day I'm, I'm back. Mm -hmm. That's, for me, it's the best music for getting recomposed. <laughs> <laughs> My topic is that reading Wilbur is like listening to Bach. Okay, for now Wilbur, I don't read him anymore. That's too long. No, but for <laughs> him, it was like listening to Bach. Yeah. Who said that? Reading Wilbur. Can no, Wilbur. no, I heard what you said, but who said that? Oh, that's for um, you. Michael Habeke. He, oh, is, he also oh. translated Wilbur a lot. And, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, it's interesting what you said about Bach, Heidi, because I, I feel the same way that that's... Um, and actually, I, I read Pablo Casal's autobiography, and and he started every morning... Well, I mean, this is when he was old, of course, and he probably, I don't know where he lived, but it obviously was somewhere beautiful because it was on the beach somewhere, <laughs> some beach. But he would wake up in the morning and um, the first thing he would do is sit down at the piano, not at the cello. And he would play some Bach, um, you know, inventions or whatever he played, partitas, I don't know, um, to just to wake up and clear his mind and be settled. And then he would go for a long walk at the beach and then he would come home and practice the cello because then he was ready. And I think that's so interesting. And um, when I was swimming, I would swim for an hour a day. I've got to start doing that again. Um, in my pool, I would play the Goldberg variations at really, really loudly so I could hear them while I was swimming. And I would know, um, well, they're not quite an hour. It's like 52 minutes, but that was instead of having the clock, I would just have the Goldberg variations on. <laughs> And now I know them so well that I would know, okay, that's that's the halfway point. Now I have to, you know, another half hour. But it's it's, it's such a um it's cleansing. It uh, it's I it, now, of course, when I hear the Goldberg variations anywhere, I associate them with water because of my <laughs> swimming ritual. But um, but there's something about Bach that's that's totally cleansing and and it transcends um. I don't know, it trans transcends all the kind of everyday earthliness. And what's so strange is that when you read his diaries, he seemed totally the opposite, like totally obsessed about how much he was getting paid or not, or whether the, whether some of the choir boys should be, you know, um, expelled from the choir because they didn't, their voices weren't good or they were about to change or, you know, he was constantly, it was like Andy Warhol's diary. It was all about money and <laughs> And about I complaining. Know the diaries and, by Bach. It's interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it's strange how it's, um, you know, that that this this exalted music was in a particular realm that, like, it, it didn't even touch him in some way. It was like mm -hmm. he was, like, he was a uh, channeling this this mm -hmm. kind of sacred mm -hmm. 
architecture. I mean, I, th I think of his music as architecture. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Hmm. And what about you, Beatrice? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to figure that out. Um, I mean, sometimes it's just noticing, trying to find the beauty wherever I am, like pausing to look at and try to find something beautiful. And and often, I mean, it's it's you know you don't. Sometimes you can just look out the window, or you can look at nature. But sometimes, you know, if you're in a place that doesn't have any of that, you can find an interesting shadow on the wall or the way that two objects you know the colors complement each other where you are or something I don't know I that's that's something um slow breathing um breathing breathing out for as long as breathing in and like kind of me measuring that um dancing when I do it <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's often hard for me to slow down and ground. And I, and I feel like right now, anyway, I mean, I'm hoping now that I'm in one place for a bit longer, I can start to develop routine, but I really don't have a routine right now. Um, so I mean, I'm not the most structured routine person in general, so I doubt it'll ever become, you know, some people have their morning ritual and I think they do every day. Um, I don't know that that's going to be me, but I might have some more, you know, common threads <laughs> week to week or day to day. Um, and I'm looking forward to finding what those are. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Victoria, that was your uh, suggestion, the reinforcement, spiritual reinforcement, because you said um, you do so many courses because you need them to keep keep you going, let's say. Do you want to say a little bit more about that? We, we, we talked about before we opened the recording, so... Uh, yeah, well, What do you get out of the courses, you know? What is it what you're looking for there? Yeah, well, it's interesting because I, um, at first it was just, you know, I didn't know anything at all. So, and and I love to learn. I'm I'm just, I like, it's probably the one thing I like better than food, that it's there in close competition. Um, <laughs> uh, a lot fewer calories. Um, but I, I realized that I have an kind of almost, almost insatiable curiosity about new things, learning new 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 ideas, and um, and just as an example, right now I'm taking three courses with with one particular um, meditation center in in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I mean, so everything I'm doing is on Zoom, of course, and. Um, and it, the reason I'm doing that is that it, th those are three, that's a very closely knit community. So all the, you know, the teachers who, are, who teach there have worked together for decades. But what's interesting is that these three courses, um, they weren't designed to go together. But when I got the email, each one addresses a different aspect that I want to work on. So the one that's, you know, like on Mondays, is called knowing enough. And, and at first I thought it was knowing enough. And I thought, oh, well, I can never know enough, you know, because I love to learn. But that's not, not what she meant by it. It's it's even more important because it's knowing enough, meaning, I mean, with only the quotes around the enough and not around the knowing, um, the idea of how we do grasp all the time at things. And um, we always think we need more or we feel we have too much, but it's always this grasping or pushing away. Of course, that's the classic Buddhist. You know, those are the things that um, that cause suffering, according to Buddhism. So her, her, what she's teaching us to do is is just 
for, we, we're doing a gratitude practice. We have what we, she calls a Dharma buddy that they were just assigned to us. We were assigned ra randomly in pairs and we're supposed to communicate every day um, and just say something we're grateful for that day. And then um, in our daily homework, we're supposed to just experience the flow, feel like life is flowing through us. Instead of, instead of taking or pushing away, we're supposed to just be and then let let the experiences of the day just flow through us as if we were um, you know permeable completely. And it's a very and not so not hold on to anything and not push anything away, just sort of let it be. It is what it is. And then the another class is about um, just realizing that we're causing our own suffering. It's, this is taught by a 90-year-old man who's very wise and has a tremendous sense of humor. He's really hilarious. And um, and he, he he's just reached a point where it's just, you know, be content with what is. And if you're trying something, you know, it's you're just going to cause suffering. Just, just um, of course, for him, it's easy because he's 90, so he doesn't have to try anymore, but... Um, but that's like a totally different experience to work with him. And these are all in the same school. I'm just using it as an example. And then the third one is, um, is a really hard. That's about, um, I forgot the title of it, but the homework that he just sent in this morning for this week is, um, is about fixed views. So learning to what, what fixed views do we have? If we have something that we really, um, like like pet peeves. So he says it can go from the trivial, like the example he gave for himself was he hates to see dirty dishes in the sink. He feels that the sink is a working place and the dirty dishes should always be on the counter. And then you do your work in the sink. Things shouldn't be piling up in the sink. I mean, he just gave it as a stupid example, but then there are bigger ones like, um, I don't know, I can't think of a bigger one, oddly enough, but um, well, thing, I mean, of course, they would be could be very serious with some people like racism or or um, or misogyny or or, you know, they could be really serious views that are very destructive political views or spiritual views. Um, but the whole range. So it's it's the idea also the idea of letting go that um, and his his motto is gratification masks. Dukkha. Dukkha is the um, Pali word for suffering. And and I and I think that's really interesting. I'm still kind of, I think about that every day. So this idea that the gratification is great. We all, you know, we all look for gratification in, in millions of different ways in our lives, but it can be a, just a masking of, of suffering. Like it's just covering over the surface. So again, I mean, they all boil down to exactly the same thing, which is don't grasp and don't push away. Just, just accept, just let it be. Um, and I guess Beatrice is really, well, she, I think a lot of it's age related. I, if you tried to teach this to me 20 years ago, I would have just thrown you out of the house. <laughs> uh, so I think, you know, like this 90 year old teacher, it's, it's clear, you know, he's had a lifetime to do all kinds of things, you know, to have a career and have a family and do all these things, you know, so like in, you know, it's like in Asia, the sages, ever since the beginning of time, like the great ancient Chinese sages and Japanese, whatever, that, that's their job in the, in the latter end of their life is just to sit around and meditate. And then people come to visit them and they impart their wisdom to the younger people. Well, that's actually true in the Christian tradition, the, um, the desert mothers and fathers, so there's, you know, I don't know how much one can achieve that as a, a young person, but I do know that when I, when I, you know, if I regret the end, if, if I think about like the end of the bowl of ice cream, like the two more bites and it's gone, I start to feel really badly. Like I, I don't want it to end. So if I'm eating something delicious, I can't bear the thought of it coming to an end. And then I realize. I'm suffering. So that makes no sense. I mean, it's really true that then I don't enjoy the ice cream at all because I know I'm not going to be able to have the, you know, I've had that in concerts when the music is so beautiful, I don't want it to end. So then I don't enjoy the rest of the concert because I'm, I'm hanging on for dear life or a sunset. Like I, I don't want the sun, the, all the colors in the clouds to disappear. And I don't want it to get dark because it's too beautiful. 
So it's, um, I think it's the Faust, um, O oh, Augenblick, um, Verweile dich, du bist so schön. That's, that's what it is, I think. So I feel like it's really fundamental, like, like that's human nature. Yeah. I'm glad I could, didn't have to translate that. <laughs> <laughs> I love this group. <laughs> yeah, so what we are talking about is what Beatrice said before. We want to keep everything, you know, and I recognize myself there too. We want to cling on on uh, what we have, what we think, what we do, what we whatever, you know, and want to have the permanence. We don't want to deal with impermanence, and that was the beginning of our conversation: the impermanence, you know. Then we have to accept it somehow and try to deal with it, but underneath we still want to have permanence, isn't it? And how far are uh, the the realized spiritual people able to really trans transform trans how do you say go over that and transcend. not be transcend, transcend. yeah that was the word yeah hmm. how is your experience Monia with this that you are practicing oh, Buddhism uh, a long I time you, you will remember the mantra I had for a couple of years. Uh, that everything that you go on, going, going, going beyond that, kati, kati, parakati, parasamkati, arriving at the other shore, bodhi, svaha. So you go and you go beyond that and going beyond, beyond, then you arrive. And I, I used that yeah, long time. And it was really necessary at that time. Uh, now I have a provo provocation a question. What do we need spirituality for? Well, St. Augustine answered that. <laughs> Of course, that's getting the answer from a spiritual person. I, I always think of St. Augustine saying man was created. Well, he said it in various ways. Um, one of the things he said to God is he said, you have created us for yourself and our hearts are restless until we find ourselves in you. But then in another passage, he says, we were created with a hole in our hearts and it can only be filled by God. So, I mean, my image is like a, like a jigsaw puzzle. Like you try to fit these other pieces in and you're jamming them in all these things that we're clinging to, like, you know, pleasure and um, all the different kinds of pleasure or career or, or whatever. Um, but they don't fit. They, so they don't satisfy. Um, I really believe that. Cause I, I feel to me, it's an amazing I mean, just this morning I heard about it. Actually, we went, we go to morning mass. The priest said that if you really stop and ponder what it's like when you have a, a transcendent moment in your life where you feel illuminated, there's no other experience really that is on the same level. This kind of this kind of ecstasy. And I think that's right across the board with spiritual experiences, whether you're Buddhist or Muslim or Christian or Hindu or anything um, that it's 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 remembering that that then you realize that that the, everything else kind of pales by comparison. I mean, I think saying why do we need spirituality is kind of like saying why do we need a heart? I mean, I, I mean, I think it's so so much a part of who we are. Whether we acknowledge it or not is another matter, but I feel like it's it's there. We're, it's built into us. I mean, the the all the new age people say we're hardwired, which I hate because it makes us sound like machines. I mean, to me that's to me that's totally contradictory to say we're hardwired to have compassion or something like that. Sounds very contradictory. What but do you think? Me, to me, it's Heidi when you ask, why don't you ask us why do you need to breathe? Mm. it breathes me actually so mm. 
Yeah, but that, you know, if you are not a spiritual person, you wouldn't accept that. Breathing is breathing. I mean, you stop I mean, at two minutes and then you're gone. But without spirituality, so many people live without spirituality. So it's not the same level. Well, Sorry, maybe. Beatrice, you wanted to say something? They invent a religion for um, themselves, like being vegan or... Mm -hmm. so. I was just going to say that whether whether you believe in God or whether you believe in whatever, there's still, I think every person probably could agree that they, that there is something more than the mental and the physical. That wherever you find it Us, and whatever you whatever you call it or whatever you, whatever. I, th I think any person, I mean, any person standing, I don't know, standing on a cliff looking at the ocean and the wind is powerful and the waves are rolling. And I, I don't know, I feel like there's something there that's more than just processing like the physicality and the mental image of it. I don't know, maybe not. Maybe maybe people would argue with me on that. But yeah. I think I think there's a... I think there's, but I mean, also like, yeah, I guess you could argue that it's, it's, you know, the brain interpreting something that the physical body is feeling that is giving you the, you know, endorphins, chemical, the endorphins <laughs> that, yeah, and I wanted to say, ask a narcissist if he really agrees that he needs a God because he thinks that he can do everything, you know, and he is the most important thing in the in the world. So, well, your question, Heidi, depend I think depends on whether you, yeah, whom you're asking, obviously. But if you're asking it to the like putting it out there as a challenge to for everyone to answer, so I would say, like in your case, the way you talk about music and the way you talk about your harvest and the way you talk about your dogs and the way you, you know all the things that you have that you share with us make it clear to me that you're you're very spiritually grounded and oriented it's um so it's not a matter of whether you know you i mean so I, and, and i think i mean my answer to the question would be if you find fulfillment and you find nurturing wherever that is that's feeding your your spiritual being. It's feeding your heart or whatever you want to call it, um, or your spirit or your soul. And different people, you know, like my mother said, she didn't, she said, I don't need to go to church. I can encounter God anywhere. And I believe that's true. I mean, I talk to God all day long, even when I'm going to the bathroom. So it's not, you know, <laughs> I don't, but but I know that when I do go to church, and actually my friend and I, Alfred and I, were just talking about that this morning, that our day is so different if we go to mass first thing in the morning than if we go in the evening. Because we sometimes when our schedules are too full, we go like at 5 30 in the evening. And both are nice. I mean, with that going back to that church bell thing, there's there is something about the beginning of the day and the end of the day that's nice. But um there's something about like there's something that you get that's that really like brings meaning and energy and life and beauty into the day and then everything that follows kind of still has the the sort of an echo of i don't know there's like a something that remains that carries you through but but that's how i feel but i know people you know as i said like my mother who would rather get up early in the morning and make scones and chocolate chip cookies and get on the telephone with her friends and that was how she started the day you know so it's chacun a son goût <laughs> yeah well, i mean I maybe the argument is you know that everybody needs an endorphin experience <laughs> or I don't know you know what I mean even even if you don't want to if we want to argue you know does the spiritual exist or does God exist or is it just you know our brains firing and giving us information and chemicals like there's still different levels of experience 
and different ways of being in the world of yeah I don't know I'm that's this is I'm kind of making it up as I go along so I'm not very articulate about it but but I think there's a difference in the experience of meditating or being in nature or doing things that could be categorized as spiritual things versus doing things that are practical in your home or being stressed out about something or you know I don't know there there, there is there is a qualitative difference mm -hmm. I don't know how to how to how to put my finger on it exactly um but there is a qualitative difference and I think that, that people feel more fulfilled and more um sustained and able to handle the the turmoil and chaos of the world when this other qualitative experience is part of their life mm -hmm. I would argue thank you yeah I, I was doing trying to do the devil's advocate you know I was <laughs> thinking uh, also about now the the, the book of, of Ken Wilber the Atman project where he describes that people even um, who get their endorphins for having many, many numbers in their bank account or uh, buying a lot of stuff and so on, that they are looking for, for Atman, let's say, for the spiritual, for God, but they are using the wrong approach, trying to accumulate money, trying to accumulate fame or something like that. But he said that the impulse is the right one because they want to to how can we um, formulate this they want to 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 achieve something and be to look for something let's say special which god would be you know the relationship with god and as they don't find it in god in the spiritual God, they find, try to find it somewhere else, in the career or somewhere else. But in some way, we could call that also spiritual, you know, because they try uh, only on the wrong, on maybe not even the wrong, but the non-direct way, let's say. <laughs> maybe these um, people who are very much into careers, m many of them, we, we learn that they then at a certain point of their life, they leave the career and find out that it's not the thing they they need for their heart or for their fulfillment, you know, so. It's well, and there's so many people, you know, famous actors or, I mean, of course, there are probably countless other people, but we hear about the celebrities, famous actors or musicians or, um, you know, celebrities in any field who surprise the world by suddenly committing suicide. And everyone's shocked because they think, well, that person had it all, fame, fortune, friends, you know, and and that I, I think that that's always a pointer to the fact that they they thought all of these things could bring fulfillment, could make them feel complete and whole. To me, to me, that's why I love the St. Augustine quote, because it's so it's so visual, this idea that we're all we're all actually, you know, like donuts We're made. <laughs> we're made with a hole inside. Um, by the creator and the whole idea is that we that we fulfill that relationship that's why we're here that reciprocal relationship with with our creator and so but but we we have the choice so we we're trying to fill this hole and some people are trying to fill it with you know with sex and some people are trying to fill it with drugs and some people are trying to fill it with you know fame or money like you said and it and it never quite fits we still have we're still lacking we still have that hole in that sense of emptiness so I think it's to me it's real it's really organic it, it's it's um it's one of those kind of whether you like it or not like when people talk to me about not believing in God I say well you know it, it doesn't you know I mean God God's probably sorry you don't believe in God but it doesn't you know as far as I'm concerned it doesn't change the existence I mean, I hated God for years. I hated him. I really hated him. And I argued with him day and night. But, you know, it was, it, it, it now, you know, I got over it and I got over my tantrum. And <laughs> I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't make him not exist. I mean, for me. 
Now I have the last question to Monia and you. What's the difference between Buddhism and talking about God? Because as I have understood in Buddhism, there is no God. So how can we, especially you, you are studying both of it. How can you reconcile these two concepts? You want to answer, Monia, or you want me to answer first? What? Me? Go ahead, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, to me, well, this is what I, is so exciting for me. The, um, the, no, there, there's a, there's a, there are different schools of Buddhism that are totally tied up with, um, as far as I understand it, I'm not a scholar yet, but that are still tied up with, with the ancient Hindu, um, religion. So they're the devas and the, um, I mean, they're all kind of, I forgot all the names. There are different heavens and there's the, you know, the, 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 all diff the different levels, the animals and the, the hungry ghosts. And I mean, there's a whole, it's endless. It's thousands and thousands and thousands of writings from ancient times. Um, and that's live, lived on really strongly in, um, especially in Tibetan Buddhism. It's really strong. Um, so there's a big spiritual component. So they believe in multiple gods. Um, the Buddhism that's come to the West is mostly from um, the forest tradition, which is still uses a, even the, the language that Buddha spoke, the Pali instead of Sanskrit. Like the Sanskrit Buddhism is what, you know, Buddha himself was a Hindu before his enlightenment or whatever. Um, so what's come to the West, which is mostly what I'm studying, is is called is from the Thai forest tradition, which can easily be turned into a completely secular pursuit. And that's where all the mindfulness movement came from. It, it did come out of Buddhism, even if people don't know it. Um, and what I love about that is that everything, like if you just read Buddha's own writings, um, to me, it's like the, the how-to manual for me as a Christian. It's like like the Bible actually doesn't, the Bible is sort of is is a different to me. The Bible's like sort of like a a history. It's 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 like document things written by people who knew God and you know had a relationship with God. And then it's there's a lot of history, which is you know all the gruesome stuff in the Old Testament, the genocide and all that stuff, which is it just kind of there as a chronicle. But the to me the the actual writings of Buddha and my faith are totally in sync, and and it's. I'm just delighted because I'm learning how to put my faith into action to make sense out of certain things. It's just very, you know, like I was telling you about the classes I'm taking, it's very down to earth stuff. It's just like, I feel like I'm cleansing myself by like trying to learn to, how to let go and learn all these things, which are things that Jesus said too. It's, I mean, it's, it's all through the Bible, but it's just, it's more practical somehow for me anyway. So to me, they're totally, it, it's it's like the a yin yang thing. It's perfect. It feels like a balance. Yeah, Monia? I think you expressed it very well when you said uh, it's a tool. Uh, and it's also for psychology. I studied Buddhism for the West uh, and it was most of it psychological. So yeah. it had nothing to do with God. So that's a completely different thing. But I was just now looking down at what I wrote uh, we started out with how to deal with impermanence. And my reply is that I always say this will pass too. So uh, that's how I deal with impermanence. <laughs> yeah, it's 10 past seven. Yeah, you want to st stop and we will stop. Just a little word from everybody. As a so short so check out, Beatrice. I'm still going to try to capture, <laughs> not necessarily to hold on to, but to, well, to hold on to in some way. Um, I like capturing the things that are impermanent and ephemeral. I think they're very beautiful and I want to revisit them and share them and make art out of them. So. Very good. So I, I take over because you gave me the, the, the word. I think, as your mother said, that it depends also on age. And you are in the period of, 
of doing what you are doing. And that's right. And don't get any bad conscience about it, but that you don't respond to the spiritual requirements of blah, 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 you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Anyway, I wanted to repeat that I'm glad that you are here with us. It's really, a, how can I say, an, 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 an inspiration to have you with with us and also this dynamic be between you two i think it's a big enrichment for our group really really nice thank you <laughs> and i give over to victoria <laughs> well i'm grateful for this <laughs> this is the only time i ever get to see beatrice <laughs> so it's i want to thank you for for being the um the uh, whatever the procurus <laughs> of our meetings heidi um, no, I love this group. I, yeah, that's, I, I feel like you're my family and, um, and it's the last few years have been so hard since my mother died. And, and, you know, that's when I started on this really intensive, like around the clock spiritual journey. Um, and I just, I feel like you're, you, you, you've, you make it like like feel like I I still have a family that that and I'm I'm you're you're reinforcing my my path in a very supportive and nurturing way and I'm really grateful for that because um, otherwise I think I'd feel quite isolated really so I want to thank everybody for that and it's nice to see you Beatrice every now and then so <laughs> every couple of weeks <laughs> all right so that's my checkout Monia you. Well, I already said it. Uh, uh, this will pass too. So it's just, uh, um, yeah, getting used to impermanence permanently <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> That's my checkout, yeah. And I guess at AD, you're just really used to it too. Yeah. So thank you all. Permanent, getting okay. used to impermanence. That's yeah. really great. <laughs> ciao, ciao. See you yeah. next time.